Okay, so you ever just sit there and wonder, how is it that billion-dollar software get cracked within days, sometimes even hours? I mean, these companies, they're sinking millions into making their stuff super secure, and then bam, it's just out there. If you're into this kind of digital detective work, the behind the scenes of how software really gets picked apart, hit that subscribe button. I dig into these tech rabbit holes all the time, and trust me, it only gets wilder from here. All right, it's 2013. Adobe made this huge shift go all in on a subscription model. You can almost hear the boardroom chatter. This is it, folks. We've finally done it. No more pirates. And then, two days later, a cracked version just sort of appears online to unravel a system that Adobe probably had teams of super smart engineers working on for years. If you're trying to figure out how to pick a really complicated lock, what's the most direct route? Get the key, right? Simple. In the software universe, that key is usually a serial number, maybe a license key. You type in the secret handshake of letters and numbers, and poof, you're in. There are these specialized tools. One that you hear about a lot is Ollie DBG. It's a debugger. Now, if you run a paid-for copy of Photoshop with Ollie DBG humming along beside it, it's like you've suddenly got these x-ray goggles for software. You can see exactly how Photoshop is chatting with Adobe servers. And more importantly, you can see the precise moment, the exact lines of code, where Photoshop goes, yep, this person is legit. Or, nah, show them the digital door. If you were to fire up Ollie DBG with Photoshop right this second, here's a super, super simplified version of what you'd be peeking at. First off, the program scans your computer. It's looking at everything from your processor ID to your hard drive serial number. It's basically creating this unique hardware fingerprint for your machine. Think of it like a digital DNA test. Is this the same computer we remember from last time? This is often the first place where the hackers, or security researchers as many of them are, start to poke and prod. They use tools like IDA Pro. That's the interactive disassembler. It's another one of these super-powered digital magnifying glasses. They take Photoshop's code and transform it into assembly language. So, when Photoshop gets to that critical stage, that mathematical algorithm checking your serial number, the crackers will use something like IDA Pro to set what are called breakpoint. It freezes the program right at that moment. And because it's frozen, they can see everything. They can see exactly what values the program is comparing. They can see what encryption keys it's using. They can see the precise logic it uses to decide if your serial number is valid or just a bunch of random numbers. It's like having the blueprints to the security system. And maybe the guard's coffee break schedule too. Once they have that knowledge, that deep understanding, they can then go in and modify the code. Maybe they'll just tell the program to skip those checks entirely. Now, what about that online validation? The constant phoning home to Adobe. For that, they get even more creative. They can create fake servers. These are servers that are designed to perfectly mimic Adobe's real servers. So when your cracked copy of Photoshop tries to call Adobe to check if it's legit, it's not actually reaching Adobe at all. It's talking to this imposter server, which is programmed to say, oh yeah, here's your permission slip. Have a nice day. The program then decrypts this token and stores it. It'll check it periodically to make sure you're still authorized to use the software. But if the token itself was generated by a fake server, or if the check has been disabled, it's like having that bouncer follow you around the bar all night. But you've already convinced the bouncer that you own the place. The end result? A cracked version of Photoshop that thinks it's properly licensed. It's pretty wild, isn't it? The sheer ingenuity involved is kind of mind-blowing. And sometimes they don't even need to go through all that server impersonation. There's always the option to be a bit more direct. They can inject a patch, a small piece of modified code, directly into Photoshop's core files. This patch might just change the instructions at the point of the license check to always assume you've paid. Simple, but effective. What if the situation is particularly tricky? What if the software has layers upon layers of checks all intertwined like some kind of digital knot? Well, then they might deploy something called a loader. Think of a loader as a really, really skilled impersonator standing between Photoshop and Adobe servers. When Photoshop tries to phone home to verify your license, the loader intercepts this communication. And it doesn't just block it, it pretends that it itself is Adobe. 
Technically, what's happening is the loader injects its own code directly into Photoshop's memory while it's running. It's like a stealth operative sneaking into the building after hours and rewriting the security guard's duty roster. This injected code then hunts down the specific functions within Photoshop that are responsible for license verification. Once it finds them, it replaces them with its own versions. So, when Photoshop attempts to validate your license, it's no longer running Adobe's original check. It's running the modified check. It then crafts a perfect fake response. This response is designed to match exactly Adobe's real response. We're talking properly formatted encryption, valid-looking timestamps Photoshop expects to see. The beauty of this, from a cracker's perspective, is that the message from Photoshop never actually gets to Adobe servers, because in Photoshop's mind, the loader is Adobe. It got the answer it was looking for, so why look further? Case closed, access granted. It's a constant battle of wits. This whole thing, Adobe builds a higher wall, and the crackers find a longer ladder, or a tunnel, but even if Adobe and other software companies seem to lose this particular battle almost every time, often in under a week, which is just, wow, think about that. They found a way to sidestep a lot of this cracking issue. Think about it. A lot of the newer, more critical, or computationally intensive features are steadily being moved to operate entirely and only on the company's own servers. Take Photoshop's new neural filters, for example. Those fancy AI-powered effects that can do all sorts of wild things to your images. While you might be able to crack the basic Photoshop program that runs on your computer, these AI features, they run entirely on Adobe servers. You send an image to their cloud, their powerful servers do all the complex processing, and then they send the result back to you. There's nothing to crack locally on your machine for those specific features, because the actual processing, the magic, never happens on your computer. So, for Adobe, there's next to no risk of anyone cracking that particular feature, because cracking it would mean cracking Adobe's actual physical servers themselves. And if someone managed to do that, well, a cracked neural filter would probably be the least of Adobe's worries at that point. That's like breaking into Fort Knox to steal a paperclip. The implications would be way, way bigger. There's only one problem with this whole unstoppable force meets immovable object narrative. It's almost never just one brilliant lone wolf hacker figuring out a crack for a program like Photoshop in their dimly lit basement, fueled by ramen and defiance. That's the movie version. The reality, it's usually a bunch of someones, a whole crew. Behind almost every major software crack, there's a highly organized team. These are known as release groups. Think of them like specialized digital military units, or maybe a really, really focused heist crew. Each member has a very specific role in the operation. These aren't random hackers stumbling around in the dark. They are skilled specialists, often working together in a coordinated fashion. And get this, they're often competing with other groups to be the first to crack new protection systems. The moment Adobe or Microsoft or any big software company releases a new product or a new security update, the game begins. The race is on. TikTok. They don't just want to break the software. They're competing for recognition, for bragging rights, in an underground community where technical excellence and speed are the ultimate currency. It's a matter of pride, of street cred, in a very specific kind of street. When Adobe launched Creative Cloud's shiny new protection in 2013, the one that got cracked in two days, Teams worldwide began dissecting its code within hours of its release. In fact, in this particular case, the team that got there the fastest did something pretty unprecedented. They released a meticulously documented 90-page technical breakdown of Adobe's entire security system, revealing everything from encryption algorithms and server handshakes to authentication protocols, reportedly even pointing out vulnerabilities that Adobe's own internal teams hadn't even discovered yet and the game just keeps evolving. Now you've got AI in the mix. Attackers are using AI to find vulnerabilities faster, to craft more convincing phishing emails, to break weaker passwords in a blink. But defenders are using AI too, to predict attacks, to analyze malware, to automatically patch systems. It's like the old cat and mouse game just got a serious tech upgrade. Who's training their AI better? Who's got the smarter algorithm? That's the new battlefield. So this evolving door, this whole dance, 
It just keeps on going, and the fun or the headache, depending on your perspective, will probably never stop. It's a wild ride.